Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Winter. I'm Jay McCarthy. And we are the CEO and the CTO of, of Reach. So this is our first episode of Better on Blockchain. So welcome to Better on Blockchain. We'll be talking about how blockchain technology can apply to a variety of industries. And today we're going to be talking about ride sharing, i.e. Uber. Yeah. And just one thing to just keep in mind here is that this is we're not trying to force blockchain into this. So if for some reason we come up with uh, the idea that blockchain isn't actually the, the right way to go with it, we'll tell you. It's going to be impossible for me, by the way, to say ride sharing. I'm going to say Uber, even though I know that there are other companies like Lyft. You know, it's like uh, Google or Kleenex. I just can't help myself saying Uber. Band-Aid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyways, so uh, we use it all the time. And so us as consumers, not like as business owners and technologists, I mean, what, what if I go ask my, you know, my wife downstairs or my mother-in-law, what are they going to tell me that Uber is? What, what is Uber? Yeah, so Uber is a rideshare um, <laughs> to use the word you don't want to use. It's, it's a way to be able to um, uh, anybody to be able to be their own taxi driver. They, they're, they own their own business. They own their own car and they get a notification that somebody wants to go somewhere and um, they pick them up and drop them off. You just described it from the perspective of the driver. Yeah. And, you know, with Uber, right, there's this sort of uh, asymmetric relationship because the drivers, they say, I want to pick up somebody right now. And then the the riders they say I wanna I wanna have a ride right now and I wanna go from here to here, yeah. And then we know behind the scenes there's a matching algorithm that Uber does to assign people, you know, figure out what the you know the current demand is and figure out a price. They call this a, a two sided marketplace. One time I was uh, traveling and uh, someone said that they picked me up like 30 minutes before they really did, and uh, you know I got charged this insane fee from them. And, uh, you know, I called Uber. Well, actually, I didn't call them. I, you know, clicked a button on the app and uh, they gave me my money back, like for the entire ride. They didn't just refund me the 30, uh, you know, the 30 minutes extra. They did more. So that kind of tells me that Uber is not only connecting us, but they're actually providing some extra services. insurance. Yeah, they're providing some insurance. Uber does provide a lot more than just like the... The, the connecting of the two things. Okay, so now let's talk about how we're going to do this same task, but on blockchain. Okay. It's completely different than your traditional centralized thinking. I think that what we want to do is we want to kind of end at a place that's like the sophisticated DeFi system that we have on blockchain. We want to start in a really simple place. So imagine that I can just, me as a writer, I can just launch an application. Sorry, I can launch a, a contract that basically says, Anyone who's willing to take me from A to B, where, you know, it may say exactly where it is, maybe, it'll, you know, there'd be parameters like the miles. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait for drivers to come bidding. That is really interesting. The way, the way that you can start with this is that um, building in a full auction system rather than a, a flat reset fee system. So um, the, the just kind of talking about like the, the benefit of that is that you don't like, you have price discovery built in. So that's if you put a flat fee and then nobody pays it, then you're not doing anything. But if it's an auction system or, you know, one of the many different types of auction systems, it it would go up and down depending on the demand. I think that's really neat. Like, I actually look at this as being very similar to like a, a trading platform. So one of the things that, that may, people might not realize yet is that we haven't even actually built Uber yet. So everything that we've actually been talking about has like... Like the, the, the new decentralized Uber hasn't even really kind of enter, entered the conversation. This has been purely like self-sovereign ride sharing entities floating around in the ether. Yeah, we invented me standing on the corner holding out a $20 bill. Right. Um, that's, what we, that's what we've done on blockchain. Yeah, congrats. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, because the thing is, is that, um, you know, because dApps, what they do is they empower individual users that means that the users could go off by themselves. And so now the problem comes in like, okay, well, I am standing on the corner in New York and I've launched my contract. Uh, how do any of the drivers find out about it? Um, how are they going to discover that there's a rider out there and how are they going to you know, decide what to bid and, and that kind of thing? And so we uh, have this sort of code word for this in the blockchain world, and that's called discoverability. So discoverability, again, is something that's really straightforward in the real world, but it sounds kind of strange when you talk about it on blockchain. So suppose that I launch a new company uh, and we have a website and I want you to buy my product. 
and I tell you about how great my product is. And then uh, at the end of the conversation, you're like, yeah, but like, what's your, what's your company called? Or what is, you know, what's the name of it? Like, what's the website? So you kind of have to tell people about what the name is so they can go search for it on Google. You got to tell people what the URL is so they can go type it in. So we intuitively understand that you need to uh, share information with people kind of beforehand before they actually interact with you. And so that means that there's this highly valuable resource of um, what does the driver already know when they're just driving around before I ever launch anything so that they can find out about the fact that I launched something. And so uh, there are a lot of different approaches to this. Uh, one thing that uh, you see actually in practice on the blockchain, which I think is a little bit silly and kind of crazy, is that people literally search every single transaction and study them and figure out what they do to try to learn about what's going on. So there's this really famous website called Etherscan uh, for the Ethereum network, and, and that's what it does. It just monitors every single transaction, decodes it, and then presents it in a web interface. And I think that this is a pretty poor discovery process because it's sort of the equivalent of, I don't know, like having a satellite pointed at Boston to try to figure out where the drivers are. And I think that there's a more direct way of doing things, which is, you know, when I launch my contract uh, that says I'm ready to drive or sorry, I'm ready for a ride, I like also tell somebody else or I as part of launching it that like automatically tells somebody else where that somebody else that's kind of that's what Uber is. Yeah, but at the same like that's a good point. That somebody else, meaning that it can be a centralized discovery tool. It doesn't have to be uh, decentralized to be able to take advantage of all the awesome things of decentralization. And the, the great thing there is that there can be multiple centralized applications that provide multiple di different interfaces for the actual ride sharing protocol, and the yeah. individual drivers don't have to have a separate account on each one of these. They have their their own, you know, DID, their own profile for for driving. And it's up to the 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 lifts, the Ubers of the world to provide the best discoverability, the best interface to help people find these individual floating uh, rideshare drivers or you know or the riders. Yeah, and so this is one of the reasons why people in blockchain often say that what they're building is not an application, but that they're building a protocol. And they're trying to use this idea of protocol like HTTP, or you've probably heard of like SMS or these kinds of things. These are underlying protocols that anybody can implement differently and provide slightly different services. So on in the blockchain world, what you can often do is define a protocol that allows many people to compete with one another. And this, of course, is beneficial for consumers because that higher competition will get people to offer lower prices or offer better or different services. So, um, you know, there can be something that is like, uh, you know, if, if we're thinking about like airlines, there can be the equivalent of Spirit, there can be the equivalent of Southwest, and there can be, you know, uh, I don't know, like Lufthansa or something like that. I don't know. I just kind of associate uh, fancy air, airplanes with European companies. So, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that's actually true. Maybe it's just because, you know, the ones that cross the ocean, you know, the, they're it's fancy. A hard, it's a hard to say name, right? So, yeah, exactly. Must, must be fancy. Yeah. So anyways, um, so yeah, I think that, uh, I think that there can be multiple discovery uh, tools and those discovery tools, th I think that that's a natural place to bundle um, the insurance and the reputation tracking, because those people can, for instance, say, you know, oh, we're we're gonna delist you if you don't meet our standards, maybe, or we're gonna charge you more or something like that. It's it's an option to go that way, but those those other services could just be extra decentralized protocols on top of it and the Uber discoverability just binds them all together. Because one yeah. of the things that to like, keep in mind is that even like a discovery, a discovery system, a centralized discovery system, you're still actually interacting directly with the, the uh, ride share. So um, it's, it's not like you, you communicate with the central entity and then the central entity uh, feeds the transaction through that doesn't what it is. It's just more of like the, somebody giving you directions but yet you still go where you were going to go. So another example of this is like, we're quite familiar with the difference between Craigslist and eBay. So when you buy something on eBay, you actually pay eBay and then eBay pays the person. 
But when you find something that you want to buy on Craigslist, you go meet in a dark alley and then hand someone, you know, a $20 bill and then you get your product. Um, so, you know, Craigslist, uh, in principle, they charge for listing things. I don't think they actually charge for listing things. But, uh, you know, when I was a kid, there were want ads. I got my first car by uh, looking in the want ads for an old car. And so M- many you know, they, moon ago. Yeah, exactly. So they charge they, the, the want ads. They charged you to list something. And so we can imagine that a discovery platform might just be really, they, they might uh, be a one-time thing and then connect you. And we can also imagine other uh, discovery platforms that do bundle these services. And so from that perspective of empowering and creating these protocols and competition, you can also imagine that we're basically thinking about a way to take a company like Uber and actually turn it into like five different companies. There's the individual um, enterprises of the drivers. There is the discovery platform, and there is you know insurance and um, and reputation tracking. Now, when we look at the current world, we see that all of those things are in fact bundled together into one uh, one entity, Uber or Lyft, and those companies are. I mean, they operate almost identically, um, and so uh, because they bundle all those services together. Um, that means that it's difficult to buy only one thing from them when you don't want to buy something else. So just as an example, you know, your Uber driver is always trying to give you their business card so you'll call them directly uh, later on next time you need a ride because they want to cut out Uber from, from the process. And so Uber, you know, that's a violation of their terms of service, but people do it all the time. And in fact, I don't think I've ever actually called one of them. And the reason I don't is because Uh, while I may not need the discovery because I know that this guy, you know, lives like two towns away from me and he's available all the time, I like the insurance. And so it would be really nice if I could buy just the insurance from Uber, but not buy the discovery and get a lower fare from this guy. Let's move on to the the next section of this. Yeah, definitely. Of uh, pros and cons. Like, what are the pros of building this on the blockchain? I think that the big pros are that it has the potential for being vastly cheaper for consumers because they're able and and more profitable for drivers. Because essentially what's going on is that we're cutting out a massive middleman. So Uber is a giant company that makes huge rents from the fact that they are in the middle here. And so this would be better for the drivers because they would be able to get more money and they would, it would be better for the consumers because they would get cheaper rides. So uh, I think that that's the high level thing. Um, and I think that the other pro is much harder to um, to know beforehand. But right now, the um, the ride sharing market is limited by the creativity of the people who work at Uber, the people who work at Lyft, and those are massive organizations that know that that have one way of doing things. And if we open it up and empower individual users to approach things the way that they're doing, the way that they would like, um, and um, and have the opportunity to add more Legos and more services built using those Legos, we actually have no idea what people are going to build, and they could build something much cooler. Uh, than than Uber or Lyft currently are because we would basically unle- open up their network to allow other people to build things. Yeah, or uh, on the other side of things is that the the tinfoil hat people out, out there in the world that want to participate in the system, but they don't want to participate with the big companies, they could build their own custom individual solution on the same rails that Uber, Lyft actually uh, work things on. Um so that, that that's the also very exciting thing is like the it, it allows for the the little guy to participate and really um, do what they want in the same space. And I think that those little guys, um, that's just kind of another way of saying that uh, there could be more diversification in who provides those services. I you know I can imagine a world where there are you know um, really small local organizations that are doing, um, that are like, you know, an Uber for one city or something like that. And why are they for one city? Well, you know, people might enjoy the idea that they're getting someone, they're, they're only discovering riders who are locals. Or I can also imagine, um, you know, governments trying to regulate this by saying, well, Uber is illegal, but, uh, but not Uber Boston. 
uh, or, you know, so it wouldn't be called Duper Boston, but you know what I mean? Some from the local group. So it might be actually a way to allow the, you know, the, uh, the taxi cartels to get inside of the game, um, by having them work on the same platform. Let's look at it in a more, a more positive light. Maybe governments want to um, subsidize prices so that they, they build a subsidization Lego that allows for local people to snap in between that, that brings the prices down even lower. Um, in principle, there's not really any difference between uh, you know, a bus system and ride sharing in general, except that the bus system is fixed uh, beforehand, the routes are, uh, and subsidized. Um, and you don't really uh, know exactly who you're sharing with. But I think that uh, you could sort of Uberize it uh, potentially by having, you know, the larger buses there too. So these are all kinds of pros that we're talking about. I think kind of that other thing is that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things hidden behind the scenes um, at Uber. And I think that, and, and of course Lyft is the same way. We're not really picking on Uber. Um, They're the biggest. So we yeah, can pick on them. The big... <laughs> I don't like picking on anybody, <laughs> but um, but there's a lot hidden behind the scenes, and I think that that's because they basically have the market power to not reveal everything that's going on. But uh, if there was more competition, then people would offer different uh, you know different packages of features. So, but uh, now let's get to the dark side of the, the, cons. Of the cons. Yeah, what are the cons? I mean, there are. Crypto is a con, I guess. Um, the cryptocurrency, blockchain. Um, not that many people are, you know, are, are drinking the Kool Aid yet. Um, so, like, there is, there would be a lot of uh, conversion there. Or if you wanted to uh, try to make it easier with uh, onboarding and offboarding from fiat, you would have so many regulations that you'd have to deal with because you, you have to worry about money laundering. Um, so that is one of the the big issues. I'm gonna say that uh, I don't care about that one. Um... Because, because you, you might not. <laughs> well, uh, the reason I say that is because I feel like the whole point of why we're having this conversation is to talk about why blockchain is valuable and why it can, uh, you know, hit and grow and, and fulfill the vision that we have for it. What we're doing here is we're trying to describe that vision. And I think that the things that you're talking about, uh, they're only disadvantages because that vision hasn't been realized yet. And I bet you, if you tell somebody, if you if you learn this thing, you can get 50% off your Uber ride, people will learn very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, But I think that there are cons, though. Um, and I think that those cons are that, um, you know, when we look around, there are many situations where having a single provider... Um, is really attractive compared to having to assemble something yourself. So for instance, like, you know, uh, I took my family to Disneyland a few years ago or Disney world a few years ago. And, you know, one option is to stay at the hotel on Disney world and it costs like, you know, 10 times more, or, you know, yeah, I could, uh, I could rent a car from this company and then I could like get a hotel from these people. And then I could, you know, you know, go to Sizzler today at Olive Garden the next day, and then we're, you know, grossed out, and then we're going to eat McDonald's. You know what I mean? I could, like, I could assemble it from a whole bunch of pieces, and that variety is really powerful, um, and that's that's one of the reasons that the American economy is so successful. But that single provider is, you know, does have value, and I feel like you're you're about to say, hey, hey, we can just make the single provider with all the pieces. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, that's what true. I'm saying. I, I disagree completely. Like, that could be a con. That is a... That is a con if you wa want to do the work, you but you don't have to. You can definitely, Uber can still exist. Uber can be that single provider that that built that, you know, that, that Lego masterpiece for you and you just pay a little bit extra for it. So that can't be a con. Okay. So, I mean, you proposed a con and I said, that's not really a con. And then I proposed a con and you said, that's not really a con. So that'd be, but there's got to be cons, right? I've got a con. I've got a con. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, with 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 blockchain building everything of that sort, if somebody f found a hole, they could bring down the entire system. They could uh, they could tack it. They could they could siphon money out of it. With a a centralized uh, entity like Uber, um, worst case scenario, they say sorry everybody and roll back their data databases. So like mm. that would be a con. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so basically what you're saying, you know, just to explain it again is, is that, um, 
you know, we're gonna we're imagining a protocol. Wait a minute, are are you gonna are you gonna take my con and make it a pro? Yeah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> so so basically, we're saying that uh, you know we've designed this protocol. We have this architecture with everything connecting together, and um, one of the disadvantages of that is that because we fixed everything beforehand, now we're just playing by the rules. If there is an exploit in this system, no one is in control. No one can just turn it off. Um, and then what you're saying is, is that, well, actually, what can happen in the centralized world is that I can go on a ride, uh, I can pay them, and then somewhere else in the world, someone scams somebody, and now my driver doesn't get paid because Uber decided to just roll back their database because a problem that didn't actually affect either of the people involved here, the centralized person can just say it never happened. Or, uh, you know, maybe what can happen is is that uh, Uber gets a subpoena from the FBI and then they tell them everywhere I've been as opposed to, uh, you know, me being able to, you know, have that be private by switching all my identities every time I use it. So what I'll say is that I think all three of these things could possibly be cons, but there is an answer to actually why it's not a con. A really important thing to realize about blockchain is is that it is new, um, and all new things have a learning curve associated with them, and there's trade-offs for why you want to use them. So although we're, we, although I like to imagine the blockchain world when the vision has happened, I mean, somebody is going to be one of the first movers. Someone is going to pay a, you know... $10 million Uber ride because uh, they spent a cryptocurrency that, uh, you know, uh, went through the roof later. Um, and so that price volatility is definitely a problem and the confusion is a problem. The idea that... Stable coins. All, exactly. There, well, I mean, stable coins that don't break. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. So then there's the problem that, um, you know, all of these, this whole architecture of things, I mean, it does have to start, right? So what's going to happen is that either someone's going to build the entire stack and then they they basically have that market power that we talked about before, or we're going to start with a terrible system and then we're going to gradually build on the next thing and then gradually, and then it'll take a while before it turns into something compatible with the, um, with the experience of the centralized application. Uh, or we're going to build something that, um, you know, has potential attack vectors uh, and we just have to deal with them as they, as they grow up. So all of these things are going to be problems in the long run. And I think that, uh, I, I don't know, I, I feel pretty good about that, especially this last one. I mean, I'm, I'm a little less worried about uh, there being flaws in contracts because I know that there are really great development tools to make sure that you... <laughs> wink, <do> wink. <laughs> to make sure that you don't make mistakes when you're writing smart contracts uh, and designing dApps. So I know that I know that there are ways to mitigate around all of these things. For sure. So okay, now the verdict. Sure, yeah. Can Uber be better with blockchain? I think that it can be better for the drivers and the consumers, but I don't think that there's an incentive for the companies to do it. Okay. What what, what I'm saying is is that if I'm Uber and someone tells me, uh, "Hey, make your make your product better by using blockchain." I'm going to say, uh, no, thank you. That's just a way for me to lose money. Right. Okay. That's great. So I think that's a great, great way to look at it. But could it be possible for a new company to build a better system and be profitable and make money um, by building a decentralized over? See, I think that that is kind of another problem, which is, is that um, for consumer products like Uber, uh, I mean, they need marketing. They need mindshare. And... Um, the whole premise of what we've been talking about is this is something that's going to be better for consumers uh, and not necessarily better for uh, the main provider. Uh, sorry, the, like uh, the discovery tool. So I think that I think that the the decentralized Uber is going to have much thinner margins. And but, I think that that's going to but go ahead. but what it will have is if you incentivize the um, if you incentivize the network, the platform, the protocol correctly, you have game theory. You have the ability for the individuals to be incentivized to to spread the word where you don't need a central entity to actually push it. You the the people that the early people that are part of it have incentive to make it grow. And then everybody then becomes, you know, richer. I think that um, I guess what I'm saying is I think that there is a long run path for bringing on, a, you know, a competitor 
to Uber that's based on blockchain technology that's ultimately better for consumers and drivers. Um, but I think that it just has a very different uh, business strategy than something like, you know, uh, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to support this city and then that city, and we're going to do this marketing blitz in that city and get everybody, you know, signed up and, you know, maybe discount things or things like that. Like a lot of those techniques that I see companies like the, like when Lyft goes into a new city, for instance, the things that I've seen them do, I have a hard time imagining how that's going to work. And I feel like this is because this is because it's very different and complicated and we don't know what the right thing is. And I think it's also just because it's very outside of my expertise. Um, I feel like uh, I just don't really know about that. And so that's something that I would be nervous about as I were to contemplate doing this. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's very similar to how the DeFi networks are, are getting notoriety and getting a new dude marketing is that uh, they figured it out and it's actually not much different uh, for this type of protocol. So it's not like we had to figure out a new way of doing it. We just have to borrow uh, what uh, somebody else has done. So uh, here, here's the next question. If you were an investor, would you invest in it? If someone comes to me and say, I'm building Uber on blockchain, I'm kind of going to take for granted that they understand the architecture, that they understand the smart contracts. Everything about that conversation with that company is going to be about how are you going to be the ones to profit from the discoverability, let's say. Like, where is, where's the angle that you're going to be profitable? And how are you going to help people join this market? And that's, that's going to be, um, that's going to be the main conversation when it comes to that investing. And, you know, I think that in, in my experience, people that are interested in blockchain and interested in making blockchain startups, they tend to be really interested in the technological details and really interested in what the long run possibilities are of what blockchain can do. And they tend not to be interested in these kinds of like, how am I going to grow this? What, how am I going to take a small cut out of uh, every single transaction? And I think someone that thinks like that is going to make a major difference um, for being a, you know, blockchain startup. I 1000% would invest in it. Um, <laughs> of course, assuming that they have a, a good handle of the architecture and, and a thought of about it longer than what we have in this you know short 30 minutes here. So, but the reason why I would be investing is because there is, there is two investment opportunities. There's the one that you kind of, like you hit on, um, which is actually building the business around it, building the utility around it, which is super important. And I think people don't give that enough uh, attention. Um, agree with you hundred percent there, but there is tons of, of, uh, value in getting in early in a protocol. Um, this has been time and time again, and this is a protocol that has shown it's needed and it's going to be even bigger when automated cars hit, hit the streets. When there's no longer drivers, you're just you're just renting like rides and um, a, a blockchain system like this, that a protocol that is open um, and being part of once again, the go that that uh, early uh, the early network and kind of growing with it, there's tons of opportunity there. So there's opportunities actually growing with the protocol and there is actually um, opportunities with actually making, generating revenue from being the discoverability. So let me say that another way. When, when I answered the investment question, I answered it from a, I invest in people. And when you answer the investment question, you answered it from the perspective of, I invest in the long-term value of this market and 100% agree with you there's long-term value in this market and it either there's some fundamental flaw with blockchain technology that no one knows about that it's all going to come crashing down or in a hundred years this is the way that ride sharing works um so the final question to kind of wrap it all up all right now yeah. now put your put your cto architect hat back on um how much how much time and how much resources using reach obviously um, would you would you ask for to build the MVP of this? See, I think that this this MVP is actually really simple, um, and I think that that's kind of the beauty of blockchain that we understand really well. Like, how can I have an auction, and how can I discover all the auctions that are out there and be part of them? Um, I think that that part of it, the the actual blockchain part, is really easy. I think that all the complexity is going to come in 
kind of simple stuff like how do I make it so that uh, I don't know that like there's not this 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 public record of where everywhere every corner I was standing on when I needed a ride. Uh, how am I gonna like you know all those business things of recruiting people? I think that the technological MVP of this is really simple. So if you're gonna hold me to the fire and say you know here I'm gonna point a gun at you and you're gonna tell me how long will it take you to write the code to do this? Uh, I'm gonna say hmm, I think I can write the smart contracts in like uh, I don't know two to three weeks. And then we can, uh, you know, spend quite a quite a bit longer uh, building, building you know, the, the interface. UI. Yeah, building the <laughs> interface and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, doing like the business dev, I'm going to estimate that like, you know, it's going to be six months to a year before, you know, there's like the first ride. So just to kind of like really kind of re-say that is that um, it is the same amount of time plus two weeks that would be to actually build any type of two, um, you know, a two-sided market. I mean, maybe, maybe it would be, it's not the same amount of time because like there, there are issues that you worry about when you're building a centralized application. Like how am I going to, how am I going to have long-term survivability for my servers? How am I going to make sure that my servers are always available? Well, guess what? All of those problems are just solved by the blockchain. Like you, you, you walk in and there are huge issues that are just already done. You're just solving different problems. So I think that technologically it's a wash. It's really, you know, do you want to be in this business and do you want to empower consumers and make lower prices for them and higher uh, revenues for drivers? So it's a win-win for everybody. There we have it. We have two yeses um, in different different flavors of yeses, but two yeah. yeses. I think that's uh, that ride sharing should definitely be on uh, the blockchain. But don't think that this was only about ride sharing. What we really talked about is how do you think about building dApps? How do you think about the blockchain future? You think about it in how do we empower end users? How do we design protocols for people to cooperate together? And the kinds of pros and cons that we talked about are going to be similar across the whole spectrum. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this. And uh, if you want to learn more about uh, Chris and I's company, Reach, you can check us out at uh, reach.sh. And we have a Discord community uh, where we talk about, uh, you know, the technological development platform we're building. But also we talk about all sorts of fun blockchain things. And we aspire to be a blockchain community where people are not hyping particular protocols. They're not hyping particular coins. They are simply talking about their enjoyment of this uh, this new technology and how to build practical things with it. So uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, CTO Jay McCarthy. And I am CEO Chris Swinner. <laughs>